Bonjour, bonsoir, dear friends, and welcome to JCB Live. Happy hour, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see him. But first and foremost, we're going to hear him. He has a deep, powerful voice, very assertive. His voice speaks eloquence, charisma, and his personality is one of the most joyful, exciting in the world of radio. This is Michael Horn who's created the largest network, cable, 11 million people listening to him all the time about his beautiful, charming stories and all that he had to say as the wine country, food, wine, and many other great topics. He's the founder and CEO of CRN Digital Media. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to bring one of the most famous men on wine and radio, Michael Horn. Michael, are you, are you here? I, I, am, I am here, Jean-Charles. I'm here, Mr. Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond, are you ready to drink wine? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to toast with you, Michael, but I'd I like am ready to, to toast. <laughs> I am ready to toast. Well, Michael, your voice, It's so known of many that we don't even need to see your face. Yeah, you're going to see it here. Hang on a second. The There we go. There we go. I, I'm not used to running my, my own board. But I got it. I thought you just wanted to hear me. Normally, Jean-Charles, people do not see me because, well, I'll take a look. You know, this is the whole thing. And so uh, I like to be just on radio in the background. But this is the CRN Broadcast Center. And today... We have added some JCB. This is good right here. Look at that. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 69. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says the, the pink. You like the rosé. You love that? Oh. I love them both. Oh. Mm. So the chat is going crazy because they never get to see your charming, charismatic face. Sure, they are. Sure they are. Three Hello, chat. <laughs> good to say hi to the chat. Great to see you. John, so Charles, this is actually this is refreshing. It's wonderful. This is the and you know what? Crisp. It's very good. Oh, I, I have a story behind this. I um, yeah, well, tell us the story. Go right in. I had a bottle you know, of this. A better storytelling. And, and I I tried to chill it down. You know, sometimes you cheat when it's not quite at room temperature or at a cooling temperature for a nice sparkler. And so I put it in the freezer, and somehow I forgot it in there, and uh, it was not good. And th this is a taste now of a perfectly. Uh, cooled. It's room. To, this is about what what the temperature would you say this is, John Charles? Well, serving correct serving for this. Miles away from you, but I could say it's about fifty one point twenty three and a half. Exactly what I was going to say myself. It's what it tastes like to me. No, it's great. It's crisp. It's refreshing. This is the holiday season wine. This is the one you want to have for all celebrations, even though you can only have three people at your home at a time. But what the heck? More bottles of wine to open. Invite different people, different days. Well, in any case, with the amount of wine you and I drink, three people is a lot for a bottle of wine, right? <laughs> yeah, less for us. Maybe one person. You know, you mentioned keeping the sparkling wine in the, in the ice or in the freezer is a good idea. You know what we call it in France is a frosé with bubbles. So you I don't want it to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> you basically wait till it's very slushy and then you serve it. And it's fantastic in the summer. It's actually very enjoyable. I'm sure you've had that before. No, be, and this is where we learn tips from you all the time whenever you're on my show, is you give us tips. So this is like a frosé, is that what you call it? When you kind of freeze frosé. it a little bit? It's the, it's the way to go. So Michael, tell us about your beautiful mustache and, and how old were you when you really decided to have facial hair? Yeah, I was quite young. Um, <laughs> I'd say two, three years of age. I uh, was a very manly. <laughs> no. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I, I, love, I love wines and I, and I love but people like yourself who grow the wines because I'm kind of a farmer at heart. I, you know, a lot of people talk about how wonderful the wines are and they see us tasting it. They don't realize it all starts in the field. So I used to go to my uncle's farm. He did not plant grapes, but he planted corn and soybeans and he had uh, uh, grains like wheat and rye and he would raise hay and I was, uh, you know, he would bale up the hay. And so I went there one summer and decided, you know, I think I'll try and grow a stash. 
And I did back when I was about, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, whenever they'd start to grow. And this stash has been with me. I've threatened to shave it many times. And people say, do not shave the stash. So it just sits here. It's kind of it keeps me warm. So charming. Um, Michael, a lot of our viewers are wondering, did it grow the same way on your chest or just on your on I, your? It's a family show. I would take my shirt off, but there's a bigger mustache right across the chest ah. there. It's quite a conversation piece at certain times, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I will, I witness it once in a while, indeed. <laughs> well, just once in a while, when I maybe had a little too much here. But yes, on a rare occasions, I do showcase it. Out by the pool, it's a real conversation starter. And does it grow on your back as well? Because at the pool, it could yeah. be convenient to be both sided with hair. I have a team of uh, outdoor specialists that manicure my yard. And at the same time, I will lay on the grass when they're done and they'll just top it off. <laughs> so it's a uniform. It's all about growing on a farm, isn't it? Those yeah, stack of All heads. about, that's how you do it. So growing on a farm, tell us about your first encounter with radio because it's very unusual to see someone normally who started very young, studied radio, and television, and obviously created your own business from it. So tell us about your first show. Uh, probably, um, probably like grade school. I, I got a Christmas gift one year. It was a Remco broadcaster. All it had was a speaker and it had a microphone and you could press the button on the microphone back here and you could talk into it. And I would broadcast imaginary shows as a kid it was you know great christmas gift i got it one year and from that i always listened to radio i loved I, i'm talking about real radios i'm talking about the ones i'm an old soul with tubes inside when you turn it on and they have to what we would call warm up you know so they would heat up and then you know 30 seconds later you'd be able to tune your show and so i would listen to radios and i'd collect them people would know that i was a kid loved radios they'd bring them to me and i would uh you know, I didn't drink wine at the time. I would just uh, play with the vacuum tubes. And, um, and and eventually, when I was in high school, I started my own radio station. Uh -huh. A little broadcast kit. And it you could only have a 10-foot antenna. And so I improved on that illegally with a 150-foot inverted L-shaped antenna. So I was able to broadcast for like a few blocks around the neighborhood it used to drive my mother nuts she thought i was going to be arrested and i'd have my high school friends drive over and they'd have a code like if you were there in john charles you would be one beep you know patrick would come by two beeps jen would come by three beeps and i go who's out there and i go beep 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 and then i'd play the show to him and i made him sit there for a half hour and i would next door was a very lovely young girl and she became mrs x and i would give her secrets about everybody in high school and they would be there not to listen to me. They wanted to hear the Mrs. X show. Of course, the Mrs. X show was probably about a half hour, 45 minutes into my show of playing music. So they were forced to listen to me. And then Mrs. X would come on and say, what wine was John Charles drinking just the other night? Oh, how, how does she know that? They, I don't know how they could never figure out that I was telling her all the information, but that's what I did. <laughs> this is brilliant. That's the first show. That's the first official show. So you were what, 14, 15 years old? Yeah, we're out right there for 15, 16, something like that. And I put my own radio station together. That's amazing. So then, you know, you decided to still get your bachelor's degree in radio and television. Yes. Cal then, State Northridge, which is currently closed, thanks to our friend, Governor Newsom, who we both uh, adore and love. But we want to have him open some things up at some point. But the college is closed, but I drive by it every day and go, hey, there it is. <laughs> Yeah, do you actually teach at the university now? I've taught uh, guest courses from time to time, but I've never really taken over the role of teaching. Although, you know, I, I like to educate people to things. That's right. So tell us about this education and, and how did it lead for you to be an entrepreneur and start your own show? Well, my choice for college basically was a place that had a radio station. And I'm not talking about just one of those little carrier currents that broadcast to the dorms. This one had like a 3000 watt FM station. So I go, I got to go there because I want to get on that radio station. So that was really my first professional job on a regular real broadcast station was at KCSN radio at Cal state Northridge. And, um, I did a, a bunch of shows, staff announcing classical shows, my first show. And I was terrible my very first show. 
I was in a huge room, bigger than this room behind me. And it was a classroom and it was a weekend, Saturday. The air conditioning was at about 60 degrees or lower. It was freezing. And up above me, way in the back where those TV monitors are in the back, was the control room. So you'd look up there and the guy, first time I'm going to be on the air professionally. And he's up there standing there and he's going to go, throw me the cue. And so he's up there and he throws me the cue and the mic's on. And I go, hi, this is Mike Horn. And when I got home, my brother said, I heard you swallow. <laughs> A nice tense dry swallow was the first thing i ever uttered on the radio professionally and it's gone downhill from there <laughs> <laughs> but that's that, that's fascinating that you were you really believe in destiny you were made to be on the radio why do you say that the face well, because you have that amazing powerful voice oh thank you thank and you and that incredible you know company that you build. I mean, it's phenomenal. And 11 million people are listening to you these days. Tell us about how you created it, how you build it, and, and what keeps you as well on the cutting edge of technology at all time? Well, you got to, you know, like, you, you always got to roll with the flow. For example, the beginnings, you know, I worked at a, a few radio stations from college. I went to KFI and KRLA and uh, uh, KRLA, uh, KEB, uh, uh, KIEV in Los Angeles. I worked at a few stations. And while I was there, I'd read publications. And one day I read an article in a publication called Radio and Records that talked about, this was in the early 80s, uh, a cable operator in Phoenix had put in a system, a cable system. I mean, this is before all the networks, before HBO, MTV, everything. And he was doing it just to pick up distant signals. So he was picking up a couple of stations, trying to get some from Los Angeles, wherever he could, because they had Dodger baseball, whatever. So he's bringing the signal in. And at the last minute, he decided, let me see if I can, on this antenna, pick up an FM station. So he tuned it around and he picked up 94.7 KMET, which was a very popular FM station in the eighties in Los Angeles. And he said, I got this audio. I'm going to put it as the audio background on the channel. Kind of like we're looking at now with the screen that had the weather dials. So yeah. the camera would pan back and forth and you would hear KMET. The article said that KMET showed up with a seven share in the Arbitron, the rating service in Phoenix and the only place you could hear it was on cable TV. So I went, people actually listen to radio on TV. So that gave me the idea to start ah. CRN, which originally stood for Cable Radio Network. And we were the first audio service exclusively for cable. We knew only cable people could hear us. So we talked to the cable people and said, here's what's going to be on this channel tonight. Take a listen to this song, play this music. And we automated it. And we had an oldies, but goodies. We actually had a country station and then switched it over to oldies because it was more popular and, and played that and then went to all talk radio. And so that's how it started. That's brilliant. So cable radio. So people actually do listen to radio on TV, obviously, as you said. Yes, but you've got to stay, as you said, kind of on the cutting edge. So along the way, we expanded from one channel to eight channels, all talk radio. And now, yes, we still have people that listen on cable, but we're on every app you could think of, iHeart, iTunes. You can take your cell phone, you can dial pound 250, like a phone call, pound 250, hit send. When the call is answered, they'll say, what's the keyword? You say CRN. Our app is loaded on the phone so you can listen off your cell phone, which is smart now because most people don't have radios in their homes anymore. They have smart speakers like Amazon Echo or Google Home. You say, hey, Alexa, play CRN1. And so yeah. they'll start playing CRN1. So we're on Amazon Echo, the Alexa, Google Home, we're on Google, we're on Roku, where we've got the video component going on. Everything is kind of there that's what we sort of do these days now is try to stay up and, uh, and right up on front of the new technology that's phenomenal this is brilliant so you started it and when did you really start with wine because at first you started with country music right yeah we started the at first it was an all music service and wow. so we played country music and people would say to me at the cable level well we'll take your service but uh, maybe uh, people don't like country music. So we switched it to oldies because that was sort of a mass appeal thing. So yeah, please. Thank you. <clears throat> we got to have a little more bubbles. <laughs> cheers. So cheers. So 
you know, we, we went ahead and uh, they switched it. We switched it to oldies, but goodies. And then all these networks came on with commercial free music. They're there now, like 40 channels, everything you want from jazz to country. I thought no one's going to listen to me if I've got commercials in the middle of this, but nobody's doing talk radio. So I'll switch to talk. So we switched everything over to talk. And now we're eight channels of sports talk, uh, uh, talk on the left, talk on the right, business talk, entertainment talk, religious talk, Spanish talk. And then we started doing specialized food programming because a friend of mine, Chef Piero Biondi, <clears throat> a, a great Italian gentleman, rest his soul, had been doing a show in Los Angeles on KIEV. They let him go. I said, come on over. And we started doing a morning show all about food and wine. And he had gone to the Napa Valley Wine Auction, like literally in the first or second year. I had been going to Santa Barbara from when they first started doing their tastings. And so we kind of got together and we started doing wine broadcasts from the locations. And we do remote broadcasts from Napa Valley, from Sonoma County, our favorites. Uh, you know, we go all over California, best wine. Although I do give an honorable mention to French wine. Just <laughs> You do that occasionally, well, to the French wines once in a while. We should do a remote broadcast from France with you one day. That would be very good. Well, I would be honored anytime. So explain us, though. So you have seven other shows, and Food and Wine is one of the top eight yes. that you broadcast. Yeah. And how did you get, you know, with the Chef Biondi, but how did you really get started on Food and Wine and started to get an audience? Because food... It's not that easy on the radio. Same with wine. So how did you do it? Well, Chef Piero had been doing a food show for years on this 870 AM, which is now KRLA. At the time, it was KIEV Radio in Los Angeles. So he had a lot of contacts. Yeah. He'd get a guy on from a local grocery store telling you what's fresh and what's going on. He'd get uh, a winemaker to come on and talk about the wines they're doing. He'd get a bunch of different guests. So we started getting guests in. And as we started to do the show... I might go to Napa Valley Wine Auction. I'd sit there and the walk around tasting whatever. I'd meet you. I'd say, Sean Charles, we got to have you on the show. You're incredible. You're just, your wines are, are outstanding. You are the king and uh, your lovely wife, Gina, the queen of the wine industry. We got to have you on. And so we did that along the way. Here's a story that uh, uh, she may not want you to know. The <laughs> lovely Gina Gallo actually did a weekly show with us. Oh, she years did. Ago from Sonoma oh, County. Yeah. Along with, along with a winery I think you might be familiar with, I think, I think the name is Deloche. I believe we did the broadcast from Deloche before you were genius enough to buy that winery and improve it to the outstanding wines. And we actually stayed at the guest house at a wonderful place. They have delicious wines. Now. I don't know who owns it or what happened to this until I, I did some research. It's a place called Buena Vista Winery. And we stayed at that guest house and it was such a wonderful guest house at that time. We didn't want to go around and dine. We said, let's go to the store and get some steaks. There's a barbecue here. Let's make our own dinner. <laughs> I love you saw that. You knew Buena Vista was a great place. And by the way, I do have some Pinots here that I'm tasting. But well, can I start with this? Uh, 2018 private reserve. Now, here's the thing. I cheated a little bit. This is the first time I've had the six, the number 69 JCB, the sparkler. And it's wonderful. I'm telling you, it's great, refreshing, a great rosé. This is the one for your, uh, you know, I would tell all my audience to go get this for uh, the holidays here because you're going to be doing a lot inside. There's a lot of berries there, raspberry. You get in it, you get some some jammy, kind of jammy notes. Now go on to the Pinot and uh, you can get this one. This is the um, Let's see, this is the, uh, oh, this is the private reserve Pinot Noir that we have here. What a bottle right here. I happen to have it right here so we can get that in on the shot. There you have it. Thank you. Hey, we're not used to see you showing things, but it's even better when we see you. So can you wear glasses of wine. I show a lot of things, John Charles, but that's another story for a different show. Virgil Cable, uh, Michael Horn wine show. That's the one I want to see. Now this, Pinot Noir. Oh, I shouldn't be talking. <laughs> what, you let it, what happens is it hits you with the fruit on the, the, the front of the palate, and then it sort of just like explodes across the tongue, and then it just sort of, it's, I'm not talking, it's still lingering for the aftertaste. This is not only a great sipping wine for now, and you, you hear how great the acid is? 
I'm salivating right now. This is when I love wines. A good Riesling will do that. This Pinot Noir is perfectly balanced because it's making me juice up to want some food with this thing. This, this is the 2018 Private Reserve Pinot Noir. Oh boy, the nose on this is the white food. Black you- cherries coming off of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, little, uh, I get current. I get Bing cherries and raspberries on the mouth here. This is God. You you're making me salivate. Mm-hmm. What? A- Choice. It's the wine. The okay. wine. See, I'm stopping in the middle as it explodes on the tongue in the mid palate. And I have to swallow because my mouth is juicing up. This is unfair to be drinking this during a radio show because I need food here. This would be good with any type of seafood. It would be good with a steak. Give me a give me a fillet with this thing here. This see, I'm going to swallow again. This is a great wine. I love wines with great acid when it's balanced acidity and the tannins on this sort of sit there across that mid palate and then they sit there on the end and that's where you want the food to mingle with it. You got a, anybody got a filet here in the broadcast center so I can really test this? Come on. I think you have a little barbecue in the back. I see it next to the flag. (laughs) Let's get the filet going. The flag. As soon as we have a president, I will go ahead (laughs) We'll go ahead and say this, the Pledge of Allegiance there and then barbecue something for him. Invite the president here, whoever he or she may be at any time. We never know. Hey, did you make some nice CRN mask as well? Yeah, I don't have one. Well, actually, I do have one here. And this is one that I fashioned myself. Uh-huh. I'm very proud of this. Earlier today, uh-huh. I started my day as I like to start with the Oakville grocery and this is from the actual roasting that i was there with john charles at one point the napa valley a roastery this is they have their own coffee business there and here john charles asked about the mask when i go into a store let's say i want to go into costco and maybe pick up a side of salmon or something i'll go in like this hi i'm here from oakville grocery do you have any of this fine coffee? By the way, this is the uh, the Cabernet Roast. And I just want to let you know, John Charles, I used the last little bit, so it's empty. Uh, this is, you. by the way, a question for you, and I, I don't mean to take over asking questions. Can you order this by mail from the Oakville store and get it delivered? Absolutely. It okay. will be delivered in 48 hours to your doorstep. And this is the best. The internet, and we have the Cabernet, we have the Pinot. We have the red blend and we have the Syrah, the very robust one. So yeah. each of different destinations, obviously from Sumatra to Africa to um, other islands. And uh, we promote it that way by, you know, identifying it to wine, which makes a lot of sense for you and I who are great wine drinkers, of course. You should do a, one of your shows should be all about coffee one day. Cause I'm telling you, I was into those K cups for a while and I still on occasion, I hate to say I sometimes do, but I pulled out the grinder, you know, it's all in one. I pour these beans in, you know, and I sit there, pour it in. I put the filter in, I set the timer. I wake up in the morning. I'm telling you, it's like an alarm clock. You hear those beans starting to get ground. And the best part the aroma of the coffee that permeates the entire home, that is the key to the whole thing. Is coffee the first thing you drink in the morning or you have yep. a little vinegar just to get your voice clear? Yep, yep. There's a little bit there. And uh, 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 lovely uh, uh, Rosemary Henry, she makes a little squeezings or something that you can pour into the coffee. I usually never do that in the morning. But at one point, Gary Pizzoni was at my home from the Pizzoni family wineries. Gary's a big fan of pouring stuff into the coffee. Did we ever get that bottle refilled? <laughs> he typically puts brandy, I think, right? I think something. But it has a little something in it. But uh, I just like this coffee here. Let me tell you, the aroma in the home. And then to have a really great blend of coffee and to have it ground up fresh by from the beans. And, you know, a lot of people, and I'm one of them, I make a mistake sometimes and I'll overbuy coffee and then it sits in the refrigerator for a while. And no, no, you got it. Once you open that bag, you got like a couple of weeks. Am I right, John Charles? That's about tops, right? That stops. Yeah. So Michael, give us the secret of success as a business on the radio. Yeah. Give us the ropes of, of how to build such an amazing network because you started from zero. Today, you have over 11 million 
networks around, you know, people listening and how many networks pick it up and replay we're on, it? As I mentioned, Amazon Echo, Google Home, we're on the pound 250, you dial that number on your phone. You can listen on Wi-Fi radio, you can listen on the internet, you can wow. listen on iTunes, iHeart, uh, TuneIn Radio, you name it, it's there. And then we add the video component of it on uh, on Roku, on Facebook Live, on YouTube Radio, Twitch, uh, Twitter, all these things where you can do streaming. You got to just put it together. So I guess the key is, if there's a key, is to constantly be ready to change and move because nothing stays the same. You got to be ready to broadcast on a new way. And we should be broadcasting inside the JCB Live studio. It should be a feed in there. So when you're not on the air, you should just be able to hear the shows. I, I love the idea. Why don't we, why don't we do it? We're, I'm telling you right now, the idea has just come to me. And I think right there, right behind you should be a couple of speakers and we'll blast them out. It's on Sonos too. If you got one of those Sonos systems, you can listen to it. I listen, you know, you know, when I was a kid, you could tune in like Radio France, yeah, Radio Paris, you could tune in, you know, oh boy, Radio Moscow, what are they saying? You know, and you couldn't understand it until they had the English broadcast. Now, with these Wi-Fi radios, you can tune it in like it's right behind you in your backyard. You can be listening to the radio station from your homeland. I listen, uh, you know, I have some great the country brethren in the Czech Republic where we make great beer. Lager and Pilsner, Pilsner Urquell, the original Budweiser, Czech Var. I suggest you get that in the uh, Oakville Grocery. That's a real winner. Real. As you know, most wineries, most winemakers love to have a little shot of beer after a tough day tasting wine. That's very true. And as we always say, it makes a lot of beer to make good wines because that's what they drink during harvest. That's true. So, Michael, what makes, um, you know, the, the fabric of a great show? Because you have eight different shows besides food and wine. You have all the other shows you've mentioned. So tell us about how you build all those different constellation of, of ideas and topics and how do you keep building them and making them as interesting as the last? Kind of exactly what you're doing because good talk radio is all about stories. I remember listening to Michael Reagan when he first started on the radio, President Reagan's son, and he would have a bill that was maybe in front of the, the state senate or whatever. He'd be reading the bill. State Senate bill, AB1 talks about blah, blah, blah. And he'd just like go to sleep. You'd turn him off. And he got together with a program director, a guy named David Hall. And David said, it's all about stories. And so I remember Michael Reagan telling me the story during uh, September 11th you know, it's 9-11, and the guys on board the plane that took the plane down, and he was given the story. I'm telling you, I was listening to this story. I could not leave my car. I just sat in the car, mm -hmm. locked in until he finished what he was talking about on the story. And so that's the key. This, this guy, David Hall, a program director, and he told this to me. He said, you know, I was a kid. I'm driving in the car with my dad. My dad's listening to, he's in Northern California, listening to KCBS Hall talk radio news. And he says, what does he like that for? And he started listening and he says, he's listening to stories. He was listening to news stories. And he says, he was into, David Hall was into music, top 40 music. He said he was listening to the records. And then he realized he was listening to stories that was coming to him through the record and his dad was listening to the music. So great talk radio is all about stories. It's like you asking questions and then hearing these boring stories I'm talking about. That's what it's all about. Somebody telling you a story. You'll, you know, you go to bedtime, you want a bedtime story. People like stories. And, and on that note, you know, many people with the rise of the internet, television, all the apps said, oh, maybe radio is dead. On the opposite, hasn't been radio even more successful within the time we live in? I think radio, talk radio is the, as much as music radio is out there, talk radio is the most popular and the largest format as far as sheer numbers right now. Just because people can put all their own music together. You can go and get your, you know, you had an iPod, you could put stuff together. Now you can download the songs you want. Now you listen off your phone when you're going. So people put their own channels together. Um, and so it's tough for a music station. They got to sort of say, I'm going to be all country. I'm going to be all jazz. I'm going to be this. So it's easy to go ahead and find it. I think the talk radio is, is pretty good because you can get uh, different topics, different stories that people will like. And you, you can kind of, people will gravitate to stuff that they're interested in. And I think that's the key. You're the most amazing food and wine show on the radio. 
how do you make it so successful? Because it's not easy to necessarily just talk about something you cannot visualize like food or steaks, as you just described, or wine. So what is the clue, the key to this success? Once again, it's the guess. It's, it's, it's you. You come on the show and you tell me about being a kid and your parents making wine in the living room and you and your sister sitting there doing this. And I'm, I want to hear those stories because, you know, everybody had a start. Everybody did it a certain way. You were a kid just like anybody else. And how did you get involved with it? And then you come to America and you look one day, this is a true story, everybody, because John Charles has told me, but it's bad when I'm telling the story. It's great when he tells it because he sees Buena Vista Winery and he says, this is an incredible place. Someday I'm going to get it. Now, when I stayed there, they had a tasting room and they said, well, you can't go in there. Uh, there's been an earthquake. Uh, it has to be retrofit. You, nobody can even, I said, can I go in and look? No, nobody can go in there. Go there now. And this man, John Charles Boisset has re retrofitted everything. He's got scenes in there of the count and everything else. It is a show place. You'll want to go and take everybody there, but you have to have someone that is passionate about what they do. That's what I love is people that are passionate, get them on the air. That's the secret to a good wine show. Uh, you got great wines here. We'll talk about all the wines. A lot of wine shows are, oh, oh good. Oh, so, no good acid. I want to know why you were yeah. driven to make this wine, why you want this wine to be the way it is. I want to know what's in your head. Will I retain it? Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I want to know that from the person. So I need, love that knowledge. And I think the audience likes that too so what makes you such a great interviewer and what what constitutes the great faculties of knowing how to interview so give us a little bit of a two to three minute lecture on how to interview magnificently well as you always do and i just poured by the way the next wine yeah this as you could see oh, yeah. another buena vista the vinicultural society because you've got to have the top of the top Michael, this is your winery. This is our winery. This, this is Bella's. Oh, Bella's. First, before I answer that question, you got to tell me a little bit. <laughs> Bella's selection. Who is Bella? What is what is this important? Who's Bella? One of the most charming daughter of the Count of Buena Vista. So we dedicated the Vinicultural Society as one of the most and very first unique society of all wine in the history of the U.S., created in the early 1860s. And this was this beautiful presentation that speaks volume because this is the estate of Buena Vista, as you could see it. And this magnificent view is what Buena Vista was. So Bella was one of his daughter and we dedicated this wine to her. She loved the delicacy of Pinot. And, and believe it or not as well, this actual image is the first paper that granted Buena Vista as the first publicly traded, so to speak, or investment firm as a winery in the history of wine. So the first shareholding company, that was it, Vinicultural Society. So to you. So to Michael, you, Charles, Ellis, to you. Ellis, divulge, share your secrets. Well, you, you just did it because now people will want to run and buy this wine right here. There is the map, 1857 is the date of the Vinicultural Society. So here's the thing. Having this wine in your collection, two things. It's an incredible wine. Once again, I rushed it. <laughs> it's opening up again. You see, I'm salivating and I'm, I'm smacking. And so here's the thing. There's a story behind the wine. So you just did it. My lecture could be three hours or 10 hours. You let the person you're interviewing talk. You hear their story because I hear a lot of people doing talk radio. Yes. I don't know whether they want to sound intelligent or whatever, but they end up telling the story of everybody. I, I have to tell a story because I love Robert Conrad. He, we lost him this year. He was on for 10 years on the air with us at CRN. The great Robert Conrad, the Wild Wild West, Black Sheep Squad, and the most incredible man, uh, one of the most incredible men I have met. And so we would, before he'd get a guest on, let's say you're on, he would get a, a sheet, you know, a piece of paper. We'd have all the information. He would end up reading everything that was on there verbatim and by the time he got through there was no question left to ask the guest <laughs> so he'd say okay you talk to him now mike and so then i'd interview him so the secret is to figure out why you want the person on your show to begin with mm -hmm. and then be a great listener listen to their answers 
and ask more questions that come from what they're telling you. You can have questions on you want to ask, but once you get something of interest, you know, like we're talking Buena Vista winery here. I mean, this is, I, I believe, and I may be wrong here, isn't Buena Vista the oldest tasting room in the United States, correct? That you redid and you redid this and it's like, it's incredible. And so that's the magic of going to that winery. Before you even taste the wine, you want to go there and see, well, let's see the oldest tasting room. What are they doing? And then you taste the wine and then someone tells you who's knowledgeable about Bella and who Bella is. And you taste this wine. You bring this home. You're at your Thanksgiving table. You're pouring this with turkey because it's a great Pinot Noir to go with turkey. And the next thing you know, you're telling a story about it. It's like, whoa, people, when I get through, they go, well, you're so knowledgeable about wine. I'm just telling you a story of stuff that I learned and I'm passionate about it and I want to know about it. And so I repeat that story because it's a great story. It's the truth. It's like a documentary with some personality. Well, of course. And thank you for this great advice. This is true. But within your DNA, within your personality, Michael, you have high level of curiosity too. You love people, right? And I think right. what makes a great interviewer like you is obviously someone who has all that within themselves to want to know more about the topic, the subject, the person, and all of that, right? Right, exactly. Once, and once you meet the person, you may have a preconceived notion about somebody. Once you meet them, they're a person like anybody else. And you may, you may not connect with them on one level, you might connect with them on another level. We're having problems in this country right now about politics, left against right, this and that. How do we get together? If you just look at the person as a person and find out what items you have in common with them, and that's where wine comes in because a lot of people who have wine, that's a common thing. They say, well, what wine are you drinking? What do you, you start a conversation up. Next thing you know, you're, you're connected with the wine. We joked and say that, uh, you know, we're buddies with Gavin Newsom. You know, I, I meet politicians at some time here and there at the Napa Valley Wine Auction. Gavin Newsom was always there as lieutenant governor. He'd come up and he'd say, uh, oh, hi, glad to meet you, Mike, everything. And I'd say, oh, good to meet you. I mean, it's first time. Then when I get back home, I get a letter on stationery from the desk of Gavin Newsom. Mike, great seeing you. Look forward to talking to you again. That's reaching out. Now, he's being a good politician to connect, but it does connect. So I can say, people, who do you know? Well, you know, Gavin Newsom. I think he's shut everything down, but I think he's a good guy because he likes wine. So. You know, what can you do during a pandemic? I don't know, but hopefully we'll be able to open up soon. In the meantime, I'm coming to your house for Thanksgiving, John Charles. I forgot to tell you. The door not only is open, but your seat is reserved with how many guests you want. You're welcome. And we cannot wait. But tell us about your little history with soap opera as well. Your stint on oh. soap opera. We want to hear that. Okay, well, here's the thing. Here's the story. So I had a little business. Our company is called Bighorn Productions slash Cable Radio Network, Inc. The main thing we work on is the radio now. But in the old days, I had what basically Bighorn Productions was, was a, a mobile DJ business. I worked at radio stations at KRLA. I was an oldie stations. People go, yeah, we're going to have a high school reunion. So they'd hire me because I was on the radio station to come out and play music. It was great, but it's, you know, a lot of hauling stuff in vans and rolling stuff out and everything. So one day a guy says, you know, the Hollywood women's club is going to have, I'm telling you, I'm an old soul, John Charles. They're going to have a big meeting and a lot of stars will be there. Cesar Romero will be there. <laughs> How long has Cesar Romero rest his soul been past that? I don't know. And so I said, well, I can come out and mic it for you and, and do all this stuff. They said, well, come, come on out because you know what? The guy that's part of the group is the casting director on general hospital. And you'll probably get a role on the show. So I thought, yeah, okay, it's worth it. And I said, we have lunch. Yeah, well, you can have lunch. So we set it up and they have their lunch and they take us out of the room. They put us in some kind of a dumpy room where we were able to just gnaw on a couple of uh, salads and maybe some sandwiches. However, if I had this great Pinot. Hmm. <laughs> the memory would even be more enhanced. It would be wonderful. And so, um, and again, a pause. You must always, when you taste your wine, front of the palate, mid tongue, mid palate, and then back in the back of the throat where it's just right now, first now going down. And now the juicing is coming back up. And I gotta say, these wines are great because sometimes when you take like a Riesling, the acid pops on the first a couple of sips. This is staying with me on every sip. It's good. So we do this lunch. And so, you know, they treated us maybe not in the nicest fashion. I thought, all right, maybe I'll be on with, uh, you know, on General Hospital. 
a month goes by, two <laughs> months go by, three, four, five months go by. I think about a year went by, and one day I got a call from, uh, what was his name, Marvin. He's a great casting director, not doing it anymore, but Marvin, forget his last name, was the casting. He says, come on down. He says, we're going to use you as an atmosphere person on General Hospital. Oh, yeah. Wow. So I go down there all day. I'm sort of waiting to get on. And it, it led to a bunch of different roles. I started getting speaking parts for it. Uh, I was, uh, when, when the very first role, because I was a DJ, I was the actual disco DJ in the background playing the music when Luke and Laura did their shenanigans on the dance floor at the disco. Oh. You saw it on TV. I saw the whole thing from the disco booth. I caught it all. There was much more to the scene than you can imagine at home. I saw that. So to keep me quiet, I'm making this part up. So they brought me back again this time. Frisco and Blackie were on the show. I love John Stamos, one of my favorite actors of all time. And I'll tell you why in a second. So I am receiving payola to play Frisco's record. And a woman comes over. I'm sitting on the park bench, and they hand me some cash. And I'm going, and I stuff it in my pocket and everything. And so now, now I'm there taking money to play Frisco's song. And then later on, I was the newscaster speaking part, visual part at the Port Charles TV station. So like three times, they asked me to come on the general hospital softball team. I was just cleaning out my closet this weekend, by the way. I found my jacket. I can get one arm into it. I think I've girthed it up over the years, but I still have it. So now, fast forward. I'm at Ariel Restaurant, Charlie Palmer's restaurant in New York. Yeah. And there's a big Broadway play coming up and the people are going, oh, I'm talking and things going on. And I'm sitting at the table and I said, what's going on? Oh, well, John Stamos is in a song. I said, John Stamos, I worked with him on General Hospital. Well, oh, he's going to walk right by here. So I go running out to the restaurant. Everybody's on one side of the alley and the stars are coming out right next to the restaurant. And as John Stamos walks by, I go, John, John, it's Mike Horn. I starred with you on General Hospital. He looked at me and he went, Mike, so good to see you. So good. How's everything been going? I'm loving this guy for the rest of my life. He doesn't know who the hell I am, but he is a great gentleman. John Stamos, everybody, my favorite actor. <laughs> well, he, you had your mustache. You remembered it, too. The, thank you, John Charles. John Charles, thank you. Thank you. We uh, told John Stamos and my mustache. Great story, thank you. Though. Great, great story. So, Michael, what's next? I mean, you've done so much in the world of radio acting, stunting, everything else. So what's your next big thing? Or what are you working I'm always, I'm always looking for things to do now. You know, I'm always, uh, new things, th this excites me right now. The whole Zoom thing, people come to me and say, well, what can I do Zoom and stuff? So now we're working on a new network where you could do your show from anywhere. You could do this show and we could pick it up and broadcast it on the CRN network from where you're doing it each week. That excites me. That's something new. Um, you know, voiceover, if I slow down, I think I might want to slow down and do more voiceover, maybe become the voice of JCB Wines. That would be great. Now, ladies and gentlemen. Take a little bit of a French accent, but you'll do very well. Direct from Napa Valley. John Charles Boisset and JCB Live. Something like that, you know. I like those guys. As, a, as an announcer, I like to hear people go ahead and they're talking radio stations and the guy go, 99.1 The Ranch. You know, it's like, I want to do that kind of stuff. That would be awesome. So I think we should talk about that after the show. Yes. So, Michael, maybe last last question. And sorry, I know you have something coming up in a few minutes. No, I've got wine. <laughs> Just to finish this. Cancel the rest of my programs today. I'm not able to tell Mr. Horn is going to go to his dressing room. He's not able to go on. <laughs> So what message would you send to everyone with us today, listening well, and, and dreaming of doing exactly what you've done? Well, first off, it, it, before I did the show today, I was just thinking, I've got to get back up into the wine country. It's like by this time of the year, I've yeah. gone to like a bunch of festivals and gone up to the wine country. I mean, Dave Roberts, 
the manager of the now world champion Dodgers. Sorry for those of you in San Francisco, but world champion Dodgers. Yes. I've had him on a few times. He has a, a wine called Red Stitch Wine. And I've interviewed him a few times. And he tells the story that when baseball season is done, he goes to Napa. He just de-stresses up there. He says when he's in Napa, he's Napa Dave. That's it. You know, and he's with Rich Aurelia, the former shortstop of the, their partners, because they played together on the Giants. And so he's with Rich up there, or Richie, as he calls him. And it's like, I need to de-stress and come up to the wine country. I know it's your day-to-day business, and you got to worry about what's happening with Mother Nature. And, but it's fun for a guy like me to go up there and see what's going on and look at it. It's like, you should come down to the broadcast center, hang out here and, and be with us in the studio and do the show live from here or from Roos Chris Steakhouse as soon as they open back up. So, that's right. Well, that's a great what's ahead for me is to get out and about and get back to doing some things and have some fun in the meantime, make the best of what we got. If there's a zoom thing and we can do something with zoom, let's do something with zoom. That's what's kind of fun. Exactly. And, and a message of hope maybe to everyone. Yeah. The yeah. Entry, holidays and, Message of hope is to, uh, you know, stay sane. Okay. It's like, um, you know, COVID-19. It's like, I, I had it in July for about three weeks. My daughter's in radio and somehow she picked it up at her station that she works on and somehow she got it. And, and my ex-wife and her mom uh, tested positive and she was negative. But when you go through it, yeah, there's a lot of press out there. You feel like you know, you get a temperature. I, I was had a simple case of just the temperature, but you think, when am I going to lose this temperature? When's it going to stop? When am I okay again? And, and you start thinking, maybe there's no cure. And it starts working on your brain. Don't let it work on your brain. You know, wear the mask, space out, six feet apart, do what you got to do. You know, I understand that the politicians and the leaders and the governors and the, you know, uh, leaders of the country are trying to do the best thing that they can do. Sure. You know, but let's try to see if we can, you know, get this thing moving again. I'm, I'm, I, let's pray for a vaccine, whether you believe in vaccines or not, people that believe in them will take them and maybe they'll get to that case so we can get the immunity. Cause being on a farm, you know, when I was there in the summers with my uncle, it's like you're exposed to everything and the dirt, everything, and you build up that immunity. And I'm afraid sometimes we're not building up the immunity by being locked down, but again, you have to be careful and be cautious. So you know, my prayers to everybody to have a safe, wonderful holiday season. Be smart about things. If you're going to go out protesting, make sure and wear masks, for gosh sakes, and stay six feet apart. Just do that. And, uh, you know, whatever you're going to do, just be thoughtful about it. That's all. Well, that's a great advice. Michael Horn. I Mike- love you, John Charles. You're the, I, I'll come on the show anytime because we get to drink wine. Thank you. Hey, we love it. And thank you so much. And I'm waiting for you next week for Thanksgiving. So. Tell me what time you'll be there. Have the back room open. That's got the, uh, have the table in the backyard. I promise I'll be six, nine feet away. I'm sure you're going to have a fabulous feast. I'll be there. (laughs) Absolutely. Cheers. And thank you, Michael. Thank you, JCB.